I'm Kevin Bieksa, and you're watching Nasty Knuckles. You're listening to Nasty Knuckles, the Hockey Outlaws podcast, with your host, Terry Nasty Sotomayor and former Philadelphia Flyer enforcer Riley Cote as they go behind the scenes with your favorite NHL players. Time to face off. All right, welcome back. What's, What's happening? What's up, Chris? How are you? Doing all right? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm just waking you up, trying to get you going here for today. Been jacked up since 4.30. Have you? Mm -hmm. Monday morning, jacked up? Oh, yeah. Big did, week. Did you, were you? Oh, yeah. You're banging Went on the that. eel skin bongos or whatever they're called? <laughs> well, we don't do eel skin quite yet. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know. Maybe down the, maybe down the road. Just doing maybe some recording. A little elk skin. We got to let the drums wake, right? Like, you got to let them set. Well, we did. We let, we let that settle for seven days. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God you did that because the <laughs> well, sound's not the same. The well, the skin's got to dry. When you're primal, like, got to let it dry. Got to let it dry now. <laughs> you, ever, you ever banged on a yeah. wet drum? Oh, oh, oh what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a couple times. You ever played a wet drum? <laughs> it's not. No? No. It's not very fun. And why would it? <laughs> Dude, I... It's like, as Baller and Devo messaged me, this is getting weird. That's what they both said. Like, Devo, he knows he said it, too. How's it weird? <laughs> How's it weird? <laughs> what, you playing got a drum? full a... setup. I thought the fucking Black Crows were coming out for a fucking concert. <laughs> the, the the rug, the letting the drums sit. Is it a drum or is it a bongo? What, what What's is it? It's a drum. It's a hand <laughs> drum, yeah. <laughs> it's a hand <laughs> drum. You need one of those Mr. Miyagi things. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. The meditation drum, yeah. yeah. The meditation drum, yeah. Oh, see? yeah. We'll have one of those, too. <laughs> I can't a, believe that. I got a fish drum. Uh, what? When you go fishing? Yeah. You don't fish. <laughs> well, it's called a fish drum. It's a Buddhist fish drum. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. A little tappity tap. Ooh. You need to hit the drum nast. <laughs> I don't want to hit him with them things, man. No? I get, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. Just stop hitting the bottle. <laughs> I need some bottle, I think, okay. after looking at that. I don't know. I'm kidding, man. I love it. It's great. Thanks. Appreciate the support. <laughs> I'll always support you no matter what. As weird as it can be, I will. All right. Except for the beard. Well, I trimmed long, it right. And the long hair. Eh. It's a little trimmed. A little bit more on the side. It's right it was more trimmed than last trim, week. It is. It's more trim than last night. Oh, yeah. It's trim than Did last you, night. You need to go to Tuna's guy and let him, like, really. Oh, that's, that's like a tight, tight fade. I don't know if I can rock that. Yeah, you can rock it. I don't have this. I don't yeah, have you the have style it. for that. You have the style. All you right. have the style. I'm try it out. Buddy. What's going on oh. he, around here? Well, a little, I don't want to say meltdown, but we're not, we're <laughs> not where we thought we would be. Uh, another tough weekend uh, for our boys here in the black and orange flyers. Um, Dropped a 4-2 decision to the Sabres. Um, then came back the next day against the Blue Jackets. That was a tough game to watch, 6-2. Uh, um, things just aren't uh, going the right way right now. And yeah. it's coming down, obviously, with four games remaining. Uh, they've dropped down. Detroit's actually in that last spot. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's hard. It's actually hard to believe. Yeah. It's going, yeah. going this far into the season, playing the way they have. Yeah. Keeping that play high, the intensity high, compete high, and then going through a stretch like this at the most yeah. critical time of the season seems well, it's unlike them. But yeah, it does. And, and um, you know, Baller was brought up the point there, they're, uh, I believe, since Coots was scratched. Now, obviously, he was scratched two games, came back in. But since that happened, it seemed to, I don't know if the, I'm not blaming that, but they're two, five, and three since. Um, I know he came back in the lineup, and then he was hurt last week against the Islanders, and uh, he's mm -hmm. supposedly day to day. I'm not sure where he's at, you know, at this point. If he'll be playing tomorrow, uh, big game in Montreal again. Mm -hmm. You know, games you you need, and then you have to go to the Rangers on Thursday, which is obviously they're flying high. <laughs> obviously, they're a great team, but uh, man, just disappointing weekend. Yeah, yeah, well, clearly disappointing weekend, and we'll like say the last what. Five, six, seven, so yeah. there's seven in a row they've lost. So, yeah. 
um, and and teams they needed to beat, right? I mean, especially yeah. this time of the season, obviously. Um, however, you know, you look at it from a different perspective. These, these teams are, as we mentioned last week and the week before, they're playing spoiler. They're playing yep. for jobs. Yeah. But nonetheless, at the end of the day, these guys got to find a way to get it done. So whatever has changed in the last few weeks. Yeah. They don't look like the same team. They, you know, they're they're losing right. games like they're not even in them. Uh, yeah. And that was never a thing before. So something's changed. I don't see the same team. Uh, and what what a time to have a, a dip in the season. You know? Yeah, and I think we said this last week, but the way they have to play is grueling and hard on their bodies. And then on the other side of that, like they barely practice, mm-hmm. even though like, you know, we've heard Torch say we need to practice, but it's hard because these guys are worn out. Mm-hmm. And then not to say other teams aren't yeah, because the Detroit Red Wings, the Pittsburgh Penguins, well, yeah. the Washington Capitals, they're coming down the stretch just like we did yep. uh, here in Philadelphia with the Flyers. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's actually blows my mind a little bit. How long? I mean, we're only still only that one point out, but like you said, we lost seven in a row, and to still we still just lost that spot. Yeah, I know. Yesterday, like yesterday I believe, yeah. uh, with Detroit's win, um, you know, you're right there. You're Detroit with 84 points, Pittsburgh with 83. They both have five games left. Flyers only have four sitting at 83 points, and, and Washington has five games as well at 83 points. So, I mean, it's still up in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, like we're gonna have to win out here. I think. Well, that's it. Um, and you know, just it sucks when you're hoping for other teams and, and watching the other teams. But you know, coming down the stretch here, it looked like pretty much gonna get in. And, and not to say that we won't try to stay positive here, but man, it just hasn't looked the same. Like you said, the last the last few weeks here, two weeks, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all they can do is win these next four and, and hope yeah. at that point. Start right? I mean, one at a time. That's so cliche. One at a time. But, oh, yeah, but, exactly. Exactly, but, yeah. I mean, and it's not like they can't. Yeah. They, they can do it. I agree. Um, <clears throat> You know, it's just it's just crazy to me that the, the way it's gone since that happened with uh, Kachon Couture, um, I don't know. I'm not saying that's why they've gone. I mean, it could be a lot of things. We don't know. I, I honestly think, it, and Baller brought this up the other day, we were talking, and, you know, I wonder if TK's fully healthy. And then, yeah. a lot of guys aren't fully healthy at this time of the year. I get yeah. that. But, like, um, I wonder about that. And then losing Coots again, say what you like about Coots. I think he's a huge part of this oh, team. Oh, of course, yeah. I still don't – I didn't understand the the scratching of him. And I think hearing a little bit of things going on that a lot of guys didn't really think that was a great move. But – and saying that, you still have to show up to play. Still and, have to show up. And you, you got to try to get these wins, so – See what happens here tomorrow night. Huge game, one at a time. Oh, yeah. Talk about crunch time. Oof. I mean, it was crunch time last week, but here we are. I, I do enjoy when it's this tight and, and you know, every game means something, you know, for, for the most part, for at least five of these teams. Yeah, so on to the try Easter to get that last insane, spot. Actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, the West looks like it's done. Yeah. Well, uh, St. Louis fell way behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but anyway, <sighs> got to pull up our boots here and, and uh, get a win tomorrow night. That's it. That's all you can do. It's all you can do. Do it all over again. Yeah. Three more times after that. Yeah. For and, sure. And uh, really wanted to talk about that brawl last week, Nast. How nice was that? Whew. Didn't expect. Well, Did, I shouldn't say I expected I didn't expect, the one yeah, fight. Yeah, I expected the one fight. Didn't expect the whole, the whole crew going. I at didn't. It. it was funny because you you thought it would obviously just be Rimpe going at it with Curtis McDermott, um, but. <laughs> I mean, it was everyone. And then when the three were going, the other two yeah. said, well, we might as well, as well do it. And uh, everyone was sitting down, though. Like, they didn't enjoy it. Oh, who, who likes fights? But you know, what, you know what I loved the best was uh, TNT. They were showing their reaction to it. Hank, Ace, they were going crazy in the studio. Like, oh, oh, oh. Even, oh, yeah. even Hank, you know, like, so don't give me this shit. That stuff's not important. That was wasn't... Was it staged? You could say it's staged, but it was. There was a reason mm-hmm. that that whole thing even started, and then the rest of the players that were out there, some of them who aren't known Don't for fight, physical, yeah. you know, they're they're fighting. It's a team thing, man, mm-hmm. and they stood up for one another, and that's awesome. 
to me. Mm-hmm. That's just that's hockey. That's what hockey's about. I know you're not you're not gonna have that happen a whole lot, but to see it, I don't think it was bad for the league. That's no. for sure because that was on every post, and you know you're gonna get some people saying, "Oh, it's ridiculous. It's good." Nah, no, that was awesome. That was awesome. I agree. Uh, you know, I guess you could say playing devil's advocate on it, like. I believe that that could have been avoided for the people that want to hate on the stage fighting and fighting right out of the, out of the gate. Had Rempy, you know, the the main, you know, True. the main character in it, dealt with his behavior and actions the game before, right? Right. So he runs Bastion's game one, he gets yep. a match. Yep. They go and trade for Curtis Mc, McDermott, <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, did, they yeah. go get him specifically to deal with him. I understand Rempy was very active that week, two weeks, right? I mean, right, it was like very. one of those things. But I, I believe as active as you are at that moment in the season, you still have to answer the bell from a division rival that you blew up one of their players the week before. Right. Right? I mean, I, yeah. I, I think anyways, that's, maybe that's just me. You answer the bell there, it cleans everything up. So, no, so he not only doesn't answer the bell... He goes and pulverizes whoever, whoever, <laughs> yeah. was, uh, I forget what his name was, um, uh, the European guy there, I believe, um, and elbows him, right? He gets yep. three games. So then he doesn't deal with that one, blows up another guy. So now he's got two, two guys, <laughs> yeah. you know, on essentially, you know, on laying on the ice and out of the game. So like, now this game comes, game three. It's going to happen. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, you it's, it's going to happen. You know, it's like, wait, you can imagine the dialogue going yeah. on before the game. It's like, well. Well, now let me ask you this. As, as a former tough guy, um, it was a little different back then because if you did something, you're probably going to have to answer for it that game, like you said, which he did not. But do you think Rempe, knowing this game's getting played the night before, is like, shit, I wish I would have just got it taking care of it then because now I got to sleep all night. I got to think about it. I got to think about it all day the next day. We've talked about this with other yeah. tough guys. Like it's that anxiety that it's, that's hard. You yep. think he's probably thinking that or is like, uh, who knows what the kid's really thinking yeah. in his head, but. Pretty- well, I think it's like, th- those ones are almost like, I don't, I don't want to say easier because it's like, there's a hundred percent guarantee you're fighting. Right. There's no way out of that. Oh, one. okay. So you know what I mean? Like, no, I mean, like, uh, well, it's still anxiety for sure. Cause right. you know, you're fighting a legitimate tough guy. Yeah. But I think like that whole, like, how is this going to play out? You know, is it going to mm-hmm. be in the first shift, second shift? Like, you know, that's happening in the first You'd shift. You'd rather have it for a shift. Oh right? yeah. You just get it. And, and you don't know, way. like, I mean, he don't know he's starting the game. Right. You know what I mean? Until yeah. they start McDermott well, that's and whatever what I was else. Ready to say, right? For people that, that don't under, that don't understand what happens is when you're the visiting team, you give your lineup first. Right. And that's when, you know, so I'm Labby sure. Labby matched Labby lineup. was like, all right, I wonder if Lavi pulled him and said, do you want to do that? Do you want to? Because I feel like, like you said before, Lavi said, don't worry about this guy. Just play. And we talked about that and you thought you could see Lavi saying that to him because of how busy he had been and all Maybe that at shit. that point, but like in this specific game, like if, if Lavi don't play or if start Rempe, start him, yeah. something tells me McDermott might be do, do something stupid. He yeah. might, he might grab whoever's on the well, line. Like just Keith used to say, he used to just, tell- just to send that message. Be yeah. like, guess what? You call up this, this, this big tough guy from the minor leagues. He's going to go and blow up our guys and not answer the bell. Well, guess what? Like, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like John Scott on Phil Castle. Really, I mean, you know things. It's like, something and, and like that, Chief right? Talked about. He used to do that too. Yeah, with like, Brian Leach told Brian the, Leach, "I'm gonna grab, <laughs> I'm gonna grab Zubov, or I'm gonna grab you, and yep. I'm gonna pound you because of him, because of Parrington, so, or whoever it was. Yeah, it was next. Dale Parrington, exactly who it was. Um, so, so Lavi ha- had to match, yeah, the lineup and and and, and throw Rempy on the ice, right. and then you know. But you think it was just gonna be that fight, right? You're not you're not gonna <laughs> think that no, all five guys are gonna fight. But again, like like bring this thing full circle. Obviously, there was a storyline to why the brawl happened. Most people are unaware of it, right? True. Uh, but yeah. I think like being a have having been you know a tough guy and, and being in that role, I would have dealt dealt with things differently. I would have just cleaned it up. That second that second yeah. encounter with the Devils, that, you know, yeah, fought McDermott, made that peace. Yep. Who knows if that other hit happens after the fact? That That's could be a just a byproduct too. of playing hard, and you know, but yeah. he still elbowed the guy. But I just think that like it would have settled, settled everything down there. But here we are. Yeah, you know? again. But is it good? Is it good for like 
the game. I don't know. You have you have two two camps, right? Yeah. I mean, but it certainly gets national attention. Everyone's talking about Rempy's in the highlights again. Yes. You know. Um, I don't think he's having to buy a dinner in New York City. If he's, yeah, I know, if he's right? going, yeah, he's going, <laughs> if he's out, he's going out to dinners, I don't think he's buying any. Definitely not. Um, definitely yeah. a fan favorite. Um, give the kid credit, man. He stands in there. He takes them and gives them. And, yeah. You know, I, I I enjoyed it. Yeah. Because it's so unexpected. Like yeah. you said, you, you probably expect the fireworks from those two, but for all five guys to, you know, or five on each side. Yeah. Just waiting on the goalies. I know. They? No, just waiting for it. Chilling. Just chilling. It's too early for a goalie brawl, though. <laughs> goalie brawl. Two seconds in, and you get that would dusted be great, up. No, that would be great. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, it was it was um, it was good TV. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Probably a couple of years till you see that again. Yeah, if ever. If you do. Yeah. yeah. Anything else, Nast? I'm not sure how we did in our men's league game. I actually couldn't play last night because I was in bed. I take care of all of us. Uh, <clears throat> Want to give a quick shout out to the Rebels kids that I work with in the North American Hockey League, just fell short. Ended up with the same amount of points as the team that made it in. We just had one regular season win lower. Uh, so that was that's the first tiebreaker. Yeah, kids battle back. And, you know, a month ago, I think I had said to you, like, or two months ago, I don't think we have a shot. And then all of a sudden we go on a heater, and the kids had a chance. And, uh, you know, heartbreaker on Saturday we lost. But, anyway, it was a great year. It was a lot of fun. I love yeah. those kids. Justin Hale and Maddie Gaudreau do a great job with them, and it was fun. Sucks seeing the kids out upset, you know, yeah. losing, and it's tough, tough to watch. But good group of kids. Yeah, it was fun. It's great. Year two. Yeah, the Rebs. The Rebs. So that's about it. Regroup and yeah. get ready to rock. Get ready to rock. Start training. Start training for next year. Next year, you know. I know I how it goes. You're making a comeback. Oh, you start you know training. It. As long as Always you got training. that drum in the locker room, you'll be ready to roll. Oh, yeah. Changing the game. <laughs> Change the game, Debo. All right, Nast. It's yeah. that time. It is that time. 153. Yes. I got it. You Kevin Bieksa. Let's go. Let's go. Welcome back. I'm Riley Cote. And I'm Derek Settlemeyer. And this week, got a little fanboy in me. Not going to uh, lie. Yeah, These guys are one of my favorite players, and you do that. Uh, this, this defenseman played 808 regular season games in the NHL along with 86 more in the playoffs rigs. Mm -hmm. Most of those were the team that drafted him, which was the Vancouver Canucks in the fifth round, 151st overall in the 2001 entry draft. Steal. What a steal. Yeah, You're not kidding. And we, <laughs> talked, we talked about this last week, about steals like that. You were definitely one of them. Uh, he's currently a member on the uh, Hockey Night in Canada show that He's a stud on there. Yep. I, have, I have to say that myself uh, on the panel. Uh, please welcome Kevin BX, one of my favorite players. What's up, brother? Not much. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. We appreciate your time, man. You, you got to be super busy uh, with these playoffs coming up and everything you got going on. Uh, Rig said you were just in town in the area, just coaching in Westchester, or something? Westchester, Philly area. Westchester, Philly. Yeah, a couple of years ago. It's a couple of years. A couple of weeks ago. It felt like a couple of years. But <laughs> weeks ago, we had uh, the National High School Championship. So I started at prep school three years ago. Not the school part, but I merged with uh, the academic side and I started a hockey program. Three years later, we uh, we made it to uh, represent California. And we went there and uh, we did pretty well. We didn't win, but uh, that's kind of where Riley and I re reconnected. I had one of my best defensemen get hit from behind first shift. So this poor kid, like he's had the worst injuries, like a defenseman skill guy. He's been hit from behind like three times, like first time broken collarbone, second time injury, third time, first shift of the game against Shattuck St. Mary's gets hit from behind. It's a penalty. They call two minutes, but he like rips a part of his growing off, doesn't play the rest of uh, the tournament, which was sad for him. So I was trying to get him some PT and see if we could somehow salvage it, but he wasn't able to do it. Oh, uh, it's a shame. It's a tough balance. First, yeah. first game, we said the first couple minutes of the game, for shift. It was first, first shift for the kid, so and he was one of our better puck-moving defensemen. So, uh, Jeez. so anyways, that's why I was in Philly. I uh, had fun and had a Philly cheesesteak uh, the, the right <laughs> way, and it was it was delicious. But brought my wife with me, so a first time in Philly for her, and she loved it. Oh, nice. There you go. Where, where'd straight. you get Where'd you get your cheesesteak? It was just in Westchester. I can't remember oh, okay. the name. It, it, it was recommended. I've been to South Philly, though. I, I've had it the right way over the, yeah. over the years. But um, And I actually met with uh, my buddy, who's uh, the assistant coach for the Flyers, and got to catch up and shoot the breeze. And um, 
you know, I'm definitely watching the Flyers down the stretch here. I'm hoping they can kind of get into the playoffs, definitely over the Islanders and, um, you know, even Pitt. Should I say Pittsburgh? Yeah, <laughs> over yeah. Pittsburgh. But <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big Torch fan, so I'm hoping the Flyers can uh, get it together the last five games. Yeah, yeah. we I mean, expand on that because we were gonna bring bring that up. I mean, I know you played for Torts, I think, for at least the one season. Um, there's the situation the Flyers are in the East. I mean, there's a lot going on there. Yeah, and I and I I'm a huge Torts fan. I only had the one year with him. He signed a five year deal, but after the one year, he just ended up letting him go. Which um, I remember they they brought a bunch of us in uh, to the GM's office after the season. They asked us like, "What do you think of Torts?" And I was one of the guys that definitely signed me and the Sedin signed off on him. Like, we love the guy. We want him back. Is, is he hard and demanding? Yeah. Does he call guys out in the media? Yeah. But I mean, he's a guy that um, he, he tries to get the most out of you. And at times, maybe his methods are a little bit uh, extreme, as you've seen in the last past week or so. Uh, but the goal is to get you to play your best hockey. So uh, it, he was a tough coach, really tough training camps, the toughest. And just, yeah. you know, kept you accountable, though. And, and the good part was everybody was at, at the same level. It wasn't like star players could make three, four, five mistakes before they get called out. Fighters could, you know, not. It, it was everyone was at the same uh, level. And I remember my favorite line was, you guys remember Tom Sestito played for the Flyers, too. Yeah, he sure. Was, he would tell Tom, he goes, Tommy, you'll go from three minutes a night to no minutes a night if you don't get that <laughs> effing puck out of our end. <laughs> Oh, so, like, everyone was at the same level um best motivational speeches before a game as you can imagine so mm -hmm. uh big big towards fan yeah no I, I i see a lot of the stuff you're talking about i guess we, we, we've talked about this a few times like when does his strategy start working against them and you talk about the media and like this last week or so uh he's scratching coots i mean going back was 11 Terry, 11 yeah. 12 games ago like what are you seeing is this just like a Flyers team that's just exhausted or is this like, is there some bit of a response to maybe some of his coaching strategy? I don't know. Like I can only speak from my personal experience. Like he came, he came out of the gate really hard with us and set the tone. And he, uh, he called me out. I remember in Anaheim early uh, in, in the season because of the way I played a three on two and he, and he really wants his defenseman to play three on twos a certain way. And I didn't do that in Anaheim at the end of the second period. Perry goes through me and then Getzlov goes through my partner backdoor tap in and he comes in and loses his mind on me in the dressing room and yelling at me, screaming at me. First of all, he did it back, back in the coach's room, but you could hear like the room, the walls were so thin. <laughs> we could all, so me and like a couple of defense were looking at her like, who do you think he's mad at? Like, <laughs> and is like, I think he's mad at me. And, and then Edler's like, no, I think he's mad at me. And I'm like, it could be me too. Like, we don't know. So after like listening to him yell in the coach's office for five minutes, he comes in and sure enough, it was me. So <laughs> he, he calls me out. It's fine. After the game rips me again, um, you know, kind of blames the, the momentum of the game on me, which is fine. Rips me again a, a third time. So then finally I'm like, okay, I, I got to go talk to this guy in his office. Like I, enough's enough, right? Like I play the game hard. Am I, am I going to make mistakes a hundred percent, but like don't question my character or how much I care. So, I went into his office after a day off and I had this big speech planned and like, you know, when you're like shaking a little bit, like you're so emotional and you're like, yeah, I'm going to tell this guy exactly. How I'm like, I'm a fifth rounder. I had to fight my way to get into this league and blah, blah, blah. I had this big speech and he like sits there and he listens and he goes, can you swear on this podcast or no? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He goes, uh, he's listening to me and he goes, Chiefs, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but I love it. I love how you're in here challenging <laughs> me and, I don't remember that play. I don't remember. And I'm like, well, I remember, you know? And <laughs> so anyways, like, uh, I'm like, okay, this, this went okay. And then, so we go into the room and he calls a team meeting and he calls in all the players and trainers. I'm like, oh my God, he's going to rip me now in front of the team, right? For coming into his office. And he just basically calls me and he goes, this guy just came into my office and just yelled at me and mother F me. And I respect this guy. He's like, I don't agree with anything he said, but I respect <laughs> this guy. And, and that's what we need more of. So. For, to, to your point about the Couturier, sometimes he's just looking for a challenge and he's looking for that. And then from there on end, he knew I was all in. He knew I cared and he knew I, I was I was trying out there, mistakes or not. And, and that's what he wants from his players. He wants them to be all in and care and try. And 
yeah, his methods sometimes are a little different, but they work most of the time. Yeah, yeah they no, do, for sure. Definitely. We've heard, fun, we've yeah, heard we've that, heard that about before. him a lot. Vinny LeCavier was one of the first yeah. guys that we had a few years a few years ago when I was still there. And he said, we had fuck you contests literally every day the last year and a half I was there. And, and he goes, now he's like one of my best friends, a guy I call, you know, because Vinny didn't have the easiest time here. Um, and he, he was. Well, it doesn't like, work for some life. guys. That's like right. you said some guys, it just doesn't work. Uh, like I, I can remember one guy on our team, it just didn't work for him. He just didn't respond to that type of um, confrontation on a deal. So you got, he says first day, you got to have skin to play this game. You, you do have to have thick skin right. to endure him over the course of the year. And some, the guys that do excel, the guys that don't, obviously he, usually they end up getting moved. Right. Yeah. And do you think like, I mean, obviously he does it. He said for the challenge, like he, he, he's expecting, or he wants you to confront him, right? Like he's going to push you hard enough till eventually you come into the, the coach's room and address it, or he's going to keep pushing you. Right. I mean, for him to have a powwow after you come in there, like it's some <laughs> yeah. sort of glorious thing, like shows like how much he actually loves that. I, I think the door, the door is always open for him. And, and I think he invites the dialogue. It, hmm. He obviously doesn't want guys always coming in and telling him to fuck off. Right. But I think he, <laughs> It's it's a two way street. He's not a dictator. It's it's like let's talk about this kind of thing. Show me, tell me your because he's always like, well, how do you think the game? He's always interested on how other players like. What are you thinking here? Why did you do that? So it, it is it is to meant to make you better. Yeah, no, for sure. And you'd like to think that. I mean, obviously he's you know one of the longest kicking coaches here yeah. still, and and he's got some you know major successes along the way. So. Something he's doing is working. It's just like the shelf life lands up being short, and it for for obvious reasons. I mean, he's squeezing guys, and he's and he's put, he's putting the pressure on because he's trying to get the most out of these guys. Yeah. And he's highly demanding. I just wonder, like, you know, you go this whole season this year, you know, like overachieving, getting guys to compete on the highest level, um, you know, br bridging some gaps by just pure effort and buy-in identity, and then like come to the, you know, the most critical time of the season, you know, where the the schedule is in their flyers favor actually which, been know, in their obviously a little favor. bit of a psychology game there too but you know to, to to have these games in the last you know six seven well seven in a row now not even coming really coming close besides maybe one of them uh you know i don't know what your thoughts are on on some of these games this fatigue or what well you said it like the flyers have overachieved for most of this season right and he's dragged that out of them and they've become a playoff team halfway through the season and then injuries uh, a player suspended a pretty important player suspended issues in net now like it's all kind of caught up with them mm -hmm. right so um it, yeah like is it easier to endure them if you're winning 100 percent? if you're losing it's it's a lot tougher to hear those video sessions and the, the critiquing but um it, it's still a flyers team that if they make the playoffs i think everybody would be happy with that right if i'm wrong like start of the season i don't think playoffs were really in the mix so say what you want, blame them, you know, give them credit. Um, the Flyers are where they are because of him. And if they falter down the stretch, is he a perfect coach? No, he's not a perfect coach, right? Um, like his, his, some of his things last week, like I, I just thought watching them from afar and knowing him really well, like, man, I wish he would have just maybe not after that loss attacked them. Like instead of just like you want to kind of almost be uneventful this time of the year and save that right. for after the season. Right. Save like mm -hmm. the calling is telling the guys, I don't know what we have here. The guys that can't play in the critical moments, maybe save that for out. It's a great message, but maybe not the right time for it. Yeah. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. They're, they're, we got their work cut out for them. You know, I just like watch it slip away the last seven games. So it'd be interesting. It's, uh, it's amazing though. They've held on yeah, like have. with other teams losing. They, they've, they're, they're right there. Obviously, they only have four games left and, um, so it'll be interesting down the down the stretch here, but uh, in the West there, it's it's a lot different story. Uh, you know, basically you got everybody in. I don't mm -hmm. think St. Louis is going to catch the Kings at this point. Um, I know you probably have your eye on out West there a little bit more than out East, but with your job, you probably have to do both. So, uh, what are your thoughts out there? Well, I'm more familiar with out West for sure. And I, I, I go to Kings games. I go to a few Ducks games once in a while. Um, I just think like everyone always asks like who do you like out of the West or who do you like to win the cup? And I'm like, how do you pick? Right. Like look at how Dallas just yeah. dismantled Colorado last night. Like, and, and Dallas for me was kind I of know. like that, that team where before like a month ago, I'm like, ah, I'm not really scared of Dallas, you know, like 
I don't know if they're the real deal. And that's when they were kind of lower in the standings, like third in the division. And now you're like, oh my God, what a powerhouse. Colorado is a powerhouse. Like, how do you say no Mm -hmm. to them? You know, you got the Oilers just buzzing right now. You got like the the defending champ Vegas. And if Hurdle gets in the lineup, you can't count them out either. They're defending champs. It's tough to play in T-Mobile Arena. And then you have the Canucks who, you know, they've been pretty just steady all year, steady good team. And if their power play gets hot and Demko comes back and like there's five teams I just named right there. Right? right, not to mention like the Kings, who who knows what you have with the Kings. So it's it's a grind. Like you just look at, and then forget about that. Like Nashville, right, the hottest team since since they didn't get to go to their concert. So um, <laughs> yeah. who knows, right? Pick your pick your yeah. spots. Pick your poison in the West. Are I are you a Canucks fan? Even like, I mean, obviously that's you you retired it one day. Uh, you know, contract there to retire as a Canuck because you played most of your uh, career there. Are you kind of a Canucks guy? Yeah, I, I'm a Canucks guy. I, I think I want them to do well. I, that's where I played the majority of, of my career. Am I sitting there watching every game and cheering for them? No, like I'm not like sitting there and, you know, live or die with a win or a loss. But I, I definitely yeah. am happy they're back in the finals. I still have a lot of friends in that organization and I want to see them do well. I, I think it's time, um, you know, since I left 2015, they've only made the playoffs one time. And that was that bubble year that for me doesn't right. even really count. <laughs> That's right. they, they had like the, the play in game and it was like a shortened three out of five series. So the, the fan base deserves a playoff run. Right. Yeah. And I mean, they're sitting in first right now on uh, the in Pacific you know, second overall uh, behind a hot Dallas team. Right. Like yeah. you were just saying, uh, what are your thoughts on Quinn Hughes, man? This guy, he's second on team in points uh, with 86 and 70, 77 games. And he's first among all D man. He's pretty, pretty special talent. Yeah, he's a stud and he's um, the thing that getting to know him a little bit and just from some of the talks, uh, he's a quiet assassin and and people don't know that about him. Like they see this, this mild mannered, quiet, kind of, you know, sheepish kid and kind of smiling ho-hum, but he's a killer. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing for sure. And (laughs) he he wants to like, when it's three, nothing, he wants to make it four, nothing. And he wants to make it five. And he looks at guys at the other team. and, And I know this and, I haven't really talked about it because it would embarrass him, but he looks at guys in the other team and he says, that guy can't cover me. Like in on the blue line, like that guy can't cover me in the open ice. And he's a, uh, he's a special player and he plays a ton of minutes for him. And uh, he was challenged earlier in the season. If, if you want to play these big minutes, then your game has to be here. If it starts to drop here because you're tired and you're cheating the game on the defensive end, then your minutes are going to go down. And he's like, bring it. Bring the challenge, right. and and his game hasn't dropped, and he, he defends now. This season, that's the big difference for me is he he plays well in all three zones this season, and that's because he you know he decided he was going to challenge himself and 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 be able to do that. Yeah, no doubt, he is special. He's uh, obviously, Tockett's done a hell of a job there. What a perfect fit for for that group. Yeah, are you talking about in Van? Yeah, yeah, Rick, Van, yeah. yeah Rick Tockett. Well, I'll talk and, and, and even footer footer. footer yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, like, I know Gonchar is there. I don't know how often he's there, but I, I know footer very well. Uh, we've worked together before, um, but yeah, like just getting guys to play the right way. You know, yeah. sometimes you, you hear about all these coaches and, and I don't mean to like come down, but like the, some of the new college coaches, like, oh, this guy knows the game inside and out. He's got all these systems and these fancy X's and O's. Well, <laughs> sometimes it's just about playing the right way and managing the puck and getting the puck in deep and defending from the inside out and boxing guys out and recovering to the middle and all like the simple things that has worked for the last 50 years. And <laughs> exactly. there, there's like different variations of a four check in a neutral zone, but really like you play the game the right way, like you're going to have success. No um, doubt. So it, it's just nice for them, the Canucks, to have success with all these highly, highly skilled guys by a couple of coaches that are just getting them to play the right way. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Again, like you say, talk it, footer. I mean, you could throw Chief in that bucket. Like guys that yeah. played the game and not just played the game, but played the game with, with the, the intangibles that you're talking about, right? I mean, you can X and O all you want, but like you, you got to get a group of guys compete, to buy into compete, what you're saying. Just compete. Just compete. Right? Yeah. Compete and win, win your battles, your 50 50s, or win your net front, be a dog on a bone, go into the net and not getting boxed out and get rebounds and goals like that. And if you watch the way they play, like they're not an overly big, especially their forwards, like Hoaglander and Garland and uh, Bluger. Like these are not massive guys. These are right. 
undersized guys and they just buzz around and they go to the net. JT Miller's not an overly huge guy. You would think he's 6'4 the way he plays. Yeah, right. right? Like the, the, there are guys that Dakota Joshua is a big guy, but he never played like a big guy before. They've gotten him to play like a big guy, like a big power forward. So that's talk and footer for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, oh, they got a good thing going on there. Yeah, it's been nice to see them 100%. figure that thing out. Uh, go ahead. Well, I'll go ahead. I was just gonna ask. I was gonna say you you grew up in uh, Ontario. There, uh, I wonder if you were a Leafs fan growing up as a kid, or a, or a Sabres fan because you were kind of close there. Yeah, I went to. We used to go to Sabres games with my brothers and my dad, just because we were actually probably closer to the border to Buffalo and the old odd, and it was just we'd go over there and. My dad, my dad's a big guy, steel worker, you know. Um, so we go, we walk down the alleys and we'd scalp tickets, right? Like didn't have yeah. a lot of money. So I remember walking with my dad down these alleys by the odd and just scary, scary dudes, right? With big <laughs> trench coaches and they'd open the trench coat up and it'd be like all these tickets. And my dad's like, yeah, and we wouldn't bring my younger brother. He was too young. So it was my older brother and I. And it'd be like three tickets. And then the negotiation would happen. And I'm like, oh my God. like <laughs> it was so scary. And then you'd walk in and they're obviously the nosebleeds. And the old odd was like, was so steep. It was yeah. like straight down. So I remember walking to your seat as a little kid. You're like, oh my God, this is so scary. Like, is this going to hold? <laughs> so that, that's what we went to watch was Buffalo. But I was actually a Detroit fan. We would get... Oh. Where I lived, we would get the Saturday night Hockey Night in Canada, Toronto or Detroit. And I was this big Steve Eiserman and big Bob Probert fan. Those yeah. were like obviously different types of players, but those were my guys. Konstantinov, yeah. big uh, Vladimir Konstantinov fan for obvious reasons. Um, so that's kind of who I cheered for growing up. Nice. Awesome. So what, <laughs> I was going to ask you, uh, you know, when, when did you discover that you were tough? Like, so may, maybe you answered the question, scalping tickets on the streets <laughs> of Buffalo it, 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 to generate some toughness there. But, you know, if you're following Bob Probert, obviously you had some, you know, some yeah. toughness in you early. When, when did that kind of like creep out? Was it after college or did you already know you're tough? And, and uh, no, I mean, I just, it, it's not that I knew I was tough. It's just, this is just the way we grew up. Like right. my brothers and I, we were big wrestling fans. So back then WWF, yeah. we would just wrestle and do all the moves on each other and just beat the wheels off of each other. <laughs> and then my dad played, my dad used to work for Stelco, which is the steel, big steel company in Hamilton for like 15 years before he got into the union side. But they had a full contact company league. And it was sponsored by the company and all the different departments and divisions would just grind and battle every year. So we would go watch these games in this old rink in Hamilton that doesn't even exist anymore. It was full contact. It was fighting. These guys would beat wow. the wheels off each other. Then they would go to work the next day and they'd all work in the, in the plant together. So I, I used to watch my, my dad's like six, three. Now he's like 300 pounds. He was like six, three, two fifty, like big, long ponytail, like mean looking <laughs> dude. Right. Defense <laughs> yeah. man. Use the shortest little tiny stick. He was like Phil, Wendell Clark, Phil right? Phil Housley or Wendell Clark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wendell Clark stick with a big like hook banana. And he was a demon. He would just like kill guys. And he would fight guys. And I remember always having, he always had blood all over his beard from the guys he would fight. Like short story. <laughs> the one year they actually won the the, fight, the championship was a big deal for them. And there's 10 seconds left. They score an empty net or so. They're up two goals. They're going to win. And... 10 seconds left, puck, the other team wins it. They go D to D up to the centerman. My dad comes flying from the blue line, jumps up in the air, puts his shoulder into the guy's nose and explodes the guy's nose. With like 10 <laughs> seconds left, and they're, they're already won. So I remember like Brawl, he gets kicked out. My brother and I, we, we walk with him. We had to go down 15 flights of stairs to the dressing room. So we're walking beside my dad. Everyone's like yelling, spitting on him. This one lady throws one of those big garbage cans at my dad down the stairs. If it hits me or my brother, we're dead because we were right, so geez. little. We we're like four, five, six years old. And wow. uh, anyways, like we're there in the locker room. The guy comes down. He's like, "Ow, what the hell was that?" He goes, "I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get you. I meant to get that fucking asshole right there." And <laughs> the guy. He drops his gloves and he starts walking like in the hall. And now he's trying to fight three guys in the hallway. Oh, so, uh, so that's uh, what that's what I grew up with. Yeah. Uh, all right, that right. makes sense. Then you get the Superman punch. Well, I've seen that oh. a couple of times. Right? <laughs> yeah. well, I get it now. It makes sense. It's right? it's so funny. <laughs> uh, so we uh, we had Jack McElhargy here as an assistant coach. Bucky, we called him Buck Diddy. My uh, first assistant coach in the NHL. Yes, oh, and awesome. so mm. the funny thing is, obviously, you attended Bowling Green four years, graduated with a degree in finance. 
smart man. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was so funny because I had known Jack Magelharkey because my dad was his trainer when he spent time with the Flyers in his pro career. Uh, but anyway, Bucky, the boys loved it. Like he was, Riles played for him too. And uh, we called it Buck Diddy. Uh, but uh, Bucky came out, I'll never forget. He came in. He's like, you're going to like this Piazza nasty. He's your fucking kind of guy. And I'm like, oh yeah. And he told us, he told me a story. I'd rather you tell it because I think I'd screw it up. And he, I guess when you went to your first pro camp, you may have gotten a little scuffle with a few guys or something. I can't remember exactly how it went, but he said, you were you were playing hard, playing tough, and then guys were like, who the fuck does this guy think he is? And you, you ended up maybe knuckling it up a little bit. Well, I remember the the lockout year. Uh, remember before we went to training camp, the season was already canceled. We already knew the NHL season was canceled. So I uh, like I was in the AHL for four games the prior year after my college season, just a little cup of uh, coffee at the end of the season. And I got into a fight with uh, a teammate in the bar and that's kind of been talked about too much. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so I go, I go to training camp and I'm penciled in to start the year in the East coast league. They signed me to a three year deal, NHL, AHL, East coast. And I go to camp and I just play hard. And so we're doing like drills and stuff like one-on-one full ices. And I'm following like Lee Gorin into the corner and finishing my head on him after he shoots it. You know, he does a shot, a fade away on a one-on-one and I follow him into the boards and just bury him. Right. And, He's good. He taps me on the shin pad. Great job, kid. And I don't know. I was just kind of playing hard like that. So uh, anyways, I ended up winning, you know, a, a spot on the team. I would think it was the only guy that was on an HL deal that ended up making wow. the team. And so, so that season obviously was, was Riley, you were in the HL. It was the wild, wild yeah. West, right? Like yeah. I had 15 fights that year and, and everybody, like we had a tough team and everybody had a tough team. And we had like two heavyweights. We had like Wade Brookbank and Jonathan Aiken. And then we had like oh, a whole right. bunch of middleweights, like Lee Gorin and me. And like, we had a ton, Josh Green fought a little bit. Like it was just a tough league that year. Yeah. So um, I don't know if he's, he's probably talking about the Fedorov story, but a good Jack Mack story is when I finally <laughs> get called up to Vancouver in the NHL, like the next season. Um, so we're in Colorado and in between, before the game, Mark Crawford goes to the board and he goes, he points at their fourth line and it's Brad May, Bugner, and high note he goes nobody fights these fucking idiots no one fights these fucking idiots tonight we're gonna we're gonna beat these guys so i'm like okay whatever so first period like all three of them are asking me to fight right like i'm <laughs> a new guy up i got like i think one or two fights already you know and i'm like just kind of play my game ignore them like i it's hard to say no but i'm just trying not to like antagonize them a bit but still play hard and then anyways like we go out start of the second period we're lined up. I'm starting the period and all three guys are starting and they're like, they all take their turns. Brad May, Bjexa, we're going right now. And I was like, can't. And then like, hi, no, <laughs> we're going, we're going right now. I go, I just said no to him. I'm definitely saying no. He goes, Bob Bugner, you don't have a choice. You're fighting one of us. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, well, now what do I do? Right. So yeah, right. <laughs> the puck drops and I'm just standing there and I'm expecting all three guys to run at me. Well, Heino takes the draw. He doesn't even take a, like, try to win it. He just drops the stuff and runs at me. So I fight Heino, right? So whatever, guys tap me on this, like, great job. So after the game, we're on the bus and Mark Crawford, I walk by him and Jack McElhardy and uh, he's talking loud enough so I can hear him. And you know, the rookies sit right at the front of the bus. <laughs> yeah. and he's like, this effing guy, Bjaxa, he fucking thinks he can do whatever he wants. And I'm going to send him right back down to the minors tomorrow. And and he's saying all these things. And Jack Max is saying, there, he's like, well, I thought he played well. What are you, what are you talking about, Crow? Like, I thought he did a great job. And he's like, I told him not to fight anybody. And Jack Max like, you're mad at him because he fought? And, like, Jack Max just didn't get it, right? He yeah, right. Talking about. Like, he did a great job. He stuck up for a teammate or whatever. So that was Jack Mack, right? Like, he, yeah. he always had my back my first year. Oh, he was, yeah. we had so many Bucky stories. He was just a treat, man. We had so much yeah, fun with boys him. Boys love them. Hartnell boys. used to just rip like half clappers on the ice across the ice and, you know, yeah. before practice start, just right his hit his, <laughs> hit his tuck and his th- you know, little speed wobble and Bucky's almost yeah. peeling over. Yeah. Just like, you know, bing, bang, boom. Bing, you know, bang, boom. Yeah, just always yeah. firing boys up. I, wonder, boys. wonder bar. You know, so it's like wonder <laughs> bar. <laughs> I oh, yeah. used to love it. I used to say, hey, Bucky, you ever sleep with a redhead? Not a fucking wink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many Bucky stuff. Just a little time. Oh, just a little time. Uh, he yeah. was a great guy. But he 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 told me uh, 
one of the first times I saw you play, uh, he was like, yeah, fucking love this guy, nasty. Um, speaking of your first year, that was the league was great, the American League, because there was no NHL that year. You you had a you played 80 games that year, 39 points, 192 pimps. Pretty good start for your really your first pro year. Not a bad yeah. year for you, man. And and a good, really yeah, a good really American good league, league. Probably yeah. the best it had ever been with the players that were were playing. And I know we ended up winning it. We we would have actually you guys lost to Chicago in yeah. the playoffs, and we would have you guys we would have yeah. met up with you guys in the finals if you had not. But uh so we had, I had uh, Randy Carlisle that year, which was huge for me. Uh, just to have a, an NHL caliber head coach and a defenseman who had played the game. Like he taught me a lot of the little nuances and obviously like, you know, put me in my place an awful lot. Right. Like <laughs> how, how many, how many NHL games you have kids? Like I heard that once a week and I'm like, yeah. none, it's, it's a lockout. I have not <laughs> so working on that coach. I just yeah. came out of college, but he, uh, and I remember, I remember the one time I said, I talked back to him. It was at the end of the year. And like you said, I already had 39 points and, it was in the playoffs and I felt I was starting to feel a little more confident, like, Hey, I'm one of the guys. Right. And <laughs> I said something in a power play meeting and he just, he ripped me for a minute, just swearing at me and yelling at me and calling me every name in the book in front of all the power play guys. And my face is beat red. And uh, so, so he, he kept me honest, but I remember when we went to Philly that year, it was like an 11 AM game and we're playing a gold spectrum. Oh and there's God. like, there's like half the, Half the rink or whatever was full was all kids. It must have been mm -hmm. like a school day. It's school and day game, we, yep. we had just bust in from Cleveland, which was like a six-hour bus ride the night before. So we get in at 3 in the morning. We're playing at like 11. I'm like starting, and I'm yawning on the starting lineup. As soon as the pucks drop, Josh Gratton and Mike Brown just start going totally. I remember oh, that. Yeah. Oh. And I'm like, what? Like, how is this <laughs> happening like this early in the morning? Like only oh, in yeah. Philly, right? Yeah, Owen and Philly. Yeah, the exactly. crowd was going bonkers. If, too. Um, it was a good kids, it's like it's just violent. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> kids are like, kill them, kill yeah. them. And you're like, oh, oh yeah. my god, boys, can yeah. we ease into this game a little bit? Can I get a yeah. couple passes first? <laughs> you remember we 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 it's so funny you brought that up because anyone that played in that game, anyone that we've spoken with is like, what were they doing? It yeah. was 11 a.m. Just and you can just hear just the, the flash. Yeah, just, those two just pounding each other. But yeah, yeah. I loved it. <laughs> Just yeah. two leather faces throwing knuckles oh, at each other. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. I, <laughs> no I gotta defense. Say, no. <laughs> no. Jo Gratz was. We would always be like, he's like, he didn't even hit me. I'm like, bro, he hit you like ten times. Pillows. Pillows. pillows yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pillows. Uh, speaking of, Riles kind of brought it up a second ago with your uh, pretty famous Superman punch, man. You took down two of my really good buddies, man, Andy, Andreoff, and Goody at home. And the funny thing was, well, it was funny for you. Like, you, you caught Goody, and I remember being on the bench, and I'm like, in my head, I'm like, he's got a Superman. <laughs> he's got a Superman him because everyone talked about it all the time. It's such a great move. And uh, so you did. You caught Goody. He goes right down. He leaves. So I'm taking his gloves back, and I go in, and Goody's down at the end of the, you know, he's sitting in his stall, and. He starts shaking his head. He's kind of laughing. I said, you all right? And he goes, didn't see that one coming. And I, and I go, and I said, I said, Goody, I said, Goody, you ever watch YouTube? Yeah, he started know. laughing. He goes, not enough, yeah. obviously. <laughs> I was like, it's, oh, it's funny. He, uh, so he's in Anaheim now. So yeah. I, I've actually become, he rented my, my really good friend's house when he got here. So I met him at the start of this year. We went out for wine and now we've become friends. Like we golf together. I golf with him and his dad about a month ago. Oh, like he's an unreal guy. Oh but my yeah. God. The best guy he is. He, he's the best guy. But like, like I used to, I don't know about you, Riley, but I, I watched hockeyfights.com. Like I, I had a scouting book on everybody. So like as much as I went into the fight and Hey, let, let's fight. Like I had an idea before I fought guys, what their tendencies were. Like, I knew you were a lefty, Riley. Like, I knew sure. Josh Gratton just going to stand in there and go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Like, I, I knew everybody's fighting style. Well, Gudis is not a fighter. Like, he's a hard-nosed right. top. Like, he's not a fighter. Andy Andreev, lo I love the guy as well. Yeah, he fights a ton, but is he, like, a fighter? No. Like, I, I knew with Gudis, I go, hey, I'm throwing coming in on this guy. Like, yeah, he is, right. he's not going to expect it, right? Like, when I fought, like, you know, and even against, I fought Wayne Simmons, and uh, I fought him twice, but I fought him once in Philly as well. Like. He's a fighter, right? Yeah, and right. and I, I threw coming in, but I threw with a little bit more, not respect, but maybe caution, mm. right? 
And I was just, I was watching your fight against uh, Roy, the guy in Tampa, right? That you came in and you hit him with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I started at the end of my career really throwing a lot coming in. And I learned that from Rick Rippett. And yep. I never had that earlier in my career. I was more like square off and get a good grab on a guy and control the fight that way. And then I watched this guy. And this guy comes from a boxing background. He is the best, smartest fighter and like most fearless fighter. He had great technique. But yep. his technique was boxing technique. His technique was hang in the pocket and he would slip punches. So yep. he would go toe to toe, but he was always moving his head. You never, you never really saw him get hit clean. And that's, that's right. why he was able to beat guys like Cam Jansen going toe to toe mm -hmm. when he's, he's, he was a little guy, like he was 5'10", 5'11", 180 pounds. Right. So I, I learned a lot from this guy, even though he was younger than me. And then after that, like Tanner Glass and, and even Darcy Hordachuk, I'm like, I'm going to start yeah. throwing coming in more because what an advantage. So practice, practice. Like I had my, my uh, punching bag, the Bob thing, the, you know, the MMA Bob thing with the no yeah. arms. I had that in the garage and I, I named it Dion Phaneuf and I practiced it <laughs> in my garage all the time. And, and uh, I hate to say it, but like the street fights I got into was the same thing. Like always throw coming in, always throw coming in. And now it's a Superman punch. Now it's a left hook and you just kind of keep guys guessing. So it was it was a way to get an advantage off the bat. And when it worked, boy, it looked good. But even when it didn't work, it put the guy on defense right away. Which yeah. was kind of the reason I would do it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. That was kind of my strategy too. You try and get a couple licks in early. I was always trying to come in with, I, I try to come in with a left of some sort, but I understand your perspective on that because if you, if, if it really works, it works, it looks great. And then even if it doesn't, like you said, you get a, you get a couple shots in before he gets set, however it plays out. But, well, right away, uh, the guy like is is like, oh, he's throwing a punch and he's in protect mode, right? Yeah. Like, I've never seen a guy, and, and maybe we will one day, but I've never seen a guy when one guy's coming in to throw, the other guy's throwing at the same time. That's right. Like uh, the Rocky Balboa Apollo Creed, right? <laughs> yeah. <they're coming>. yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen that on the ice. And I know, like, guys try to emulate it, and, like, uh, Gabranson's tried it, and Austin Watson's tried the, the Superman. And the other the other guy's always on defense. He he never throws at the same like whose whose reaction would to be when a guy's throwing a punch at them to throw at the same time like nobody so it's kind of a free shot. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the one one fight comes to mind is probably it, it was before our era of actually playing pro. You probably remember this fight. It was uh, it was Aaron Downey versus Jesse Bullerys. Do you remember that? Like I mean, it, oh, yeah. obviously it was a counter punch, but like yeah, nonetheless, yeah, yeah. like you talk about coming in with the bomb. And Jesse, Jesse normally did and not yeah, do know, that. He was, was so out of more character. Than that. I know. Him. He got excited uh, and then he got excited, yeah. kept flying in. And, oof. You don't see like it didn't you don't, end you don't well. See that kind of stuff. Is that often. maybe like a time where Jess? Because Jesse was a tough guy. Yeah. Um, maybe did he not respect Downey enough? I, I who know? I'm not. Not yeah, trying to put know. words into his mouth, but I remember the one guy that I got knocked out from was Tom Kostopoulos. Oh, and yeah. I went into that. I went into that fight. I'm like, he's tough, but like he's I'm not up his ass. Right. That's right. what I thought in my head. And I went in, and I could have hit him early, and I didn't. I'm like, no, no, I'm gonna like take my time with this one, right? And uh, he he got me and to a, dislocated my nose, closed my eye, knocked my tooth out with one shot. Oh wow. shit! And I, wow. I didn't go down. Like I kind of, you know, when it hits you so clean that you don't even really feel it. It's just like like a warm feeling. You get that warm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I kind of did like a half a squat, and then I stood up, and the linesman right away was in. He's like, "Go to the dressing room." I was like, "Really? Like, what do you mean?" He goes, "Trust me." You go to the dressing room, and the trainer's like on the table, like trying to put oh. to your nose back into. And I'm like, oh man, I was like, I should have won that fight if I was, maybe I didn't give him enough respect. So anyways, that happens sometimes, right? It does. Yeah. And I'm not sure on Jesse on that one. Like J Jesse had a karate background. Like yeah. there was, you know, a very disciplined martial arts. And he's, he's normally very patient with that kind of stuff. That's why I thought it was out of character, but you know how it goes. Some, I can't remember the situation of that fight, like the, 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 the timeliness of it, yeah. but maybe he just was excited and thought he had a pocket there to. <laughs> bomb them i don't know but <laughs> it happens you're not gonna win every, every fight that, you're not that. gonna win every fight and like you you tell me you might disagree with me riley but like i like to get hit every once in a while in a fight like don't get me wrong like i wanted to win every fight like that was mm -hmm. the most important thing was to win for my team and but like i kind of wanted to get hit in the fight a little bit like nothing like i didn't want my nose broken all the time and my eyes closed but i don't know like are we a little bit twisted that way where you like you kind of <laughs> want to get hit once in a while yeah, I, I may, maybe. Yeah, because I was kind of the same way. I mean, I, 
yeah, is it nice to go in, you know, guns a blazing and, you know, one, two punch guys? Like, you know, it looks great on the highlight, but like, yeah, I say some of my best fights are the ones I'm just like in there just eating punches while I'm throwing and just like, you know, it's just old school. It's just, yeah. It's like I mean, a it's ba badge of honor. Like I would go to the Montessori school to pick up my kids from Montessori. Sometimes I have the shiner yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> You kind of feel like, hey, like I'm a warrior, right? Like that's who I am. I like I I earn my money, I earn my living. So I don't yeah. know, like that's maybe a little twisted side of us. Yeah, no, I think that's part of it, right? I mean, yeah. you're not you're not really ever in a fight until you get hit, right? I mean, you're not a fighter unless you you kind of welcome that piece of it. Otherwise, you know, you're some bit of a snowflake, I would think, right? I mean, it's always yeah. easy to to say you're a fighter when you're winning, and you know, you one punch a guy. But I think the real the challenge is when you start getting hit. How do you respond to that? But yeah, who exactly. wants to get their nose blown up? But like, it's part of it, I guess. You know, if you're gonna fight a hundred, two hundred times in your career, you're gonna you're gonna get your nose broken. It's just nature of the beast. Yeah, it, and it, it kind of the reason I was it, you made it. You gave us a great explanation of your how you grew up, and it makes sense now why you're such a hard you were such a hard nosed player. But we had uh, Nick Sealer, who's a D man with the Flyers, and I kind of like. I, I'm not saying he's as tough as you, but he's a pretty tough kid yeah. and he's unassuming. Uh, he played in college as well. And that's where I, that was kind of why I asked about, you know, you played four years in college and everyone's wearing a cage. Everybody's tough, right? Like mm -hmm. probably in college, but then you prove it, you step into the big time and you prove it. And Nick's had, Nick Sealers had some pretty good, pretty good tilts here. Uh, you know, he, it took him longer to get to the NHL, but, uh, he's a pretty tough I like, guy. I like his game a lot. And I know like he was in the, the trade rumors, uh, mm -hmm. a lot this year because everybody wanted him, and he had a really good favorable contract, but he plays the game the right way and he's tough. And the thing about college and like, this is obviously the, the podcast to talk about this. I like, everyone's like, Oh, like there's no fighting in college. Like, I fought 15 times my last year in junior. Like I played tier two. I fought like eight times my second year as a 17 year old. So I had a fighting, uh, a hockey fighting background, like summer hockey. Like I fought uh, Kyle Hagel in summer hockey who fought 25 times a year in the AHL. Right. Like, yeah. like I grew up in Hamilton. Right. And right. Port Dalhousie, like there, there was fights, but in college, like I, I got in and I hate to admit this, but it's also like the right place for it. Like I got into fights in college in like street fights with bouncers trying to help get like some of my teammates in and you know what I mean? And bouncers wouldn't like <laughs> yeah. some of my teammates or they get in trouble because they're trying to, you know, wheel a girl and another guy didn't like it. So, right. you know, mm -hmm. a couple, couple fights off the ice, maybe that definitely prepared me for pro hockey. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We had the right attitude watching WWE. And, yeah, you know, yeah and right. That, that whole world going, you know, getting getting some tickets on the streets of Buffalo. Oh, I mean, I, I'll toughen you up. And in Hamilton's, I mean, it's well, you lived in the Peg too. Is I mean, I think Hamilton's much like the Peg. I grew up in Winnipeg, so I mean, it's like you know the tough cities, man. Like you, yeah. you got to have some bit of thick skin, you know, and get out of these these There's cities. Always, and, always somebody tougher too. That's the thing, right? Like, right. I didn't grow up like winning all my fights. Like there, there's tough guys everywhere, everywhere you look. Like you go to a high school party when you're in grade nine and there's like these 12th and 11th graders just beating up everyone. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. this, is, this is how we grew up. Like kids luckily now don't have to grow up like that. But that's kind of the reason why a lot of people in our era ha like fought so much, right? Like it's funny, I was having uh, – I golfed with Steve Thomas the other day and, and played in a different era. He retired in 2004, so I just missed him. And we're sitting around, and he had, he had a 20-year career, but I remember him as a goal scorer, like playing with uh, on Matt Sundin's line in, in, uh, in Toronto, playing in Chicago with Denny Savard. And I look at him, I go, how many times did you fight in your career? And he looks at me, and he's thinking, he goes, 100. And I go, what? 100? I go, you were a goal scorer. He goes, yeah, 100. So I look it up, and sure enough, he, he was 100. Like, I was wow. – I was only 85 in pro, I think like 60 or 65 in the NHL. This guy's at 100 and he was a skill guy, but that was the way the game was played back yeah. then. Like everybody, you go into Philly, you're probably fighting somebody. That yeah. was the way it was. That's right. It's true. Different animal back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've had a bunch of old school guys on. It's just like the stories and just the attitude, the you know, the energy going into games is just, it was just, it was different. It was just, uh, you, you see, you're going to war. I mean, you're, Coming to Philly, expect you expect a battle. Yeah, no question. Uh, 
we were we were talking about this earlier. Uh, what what did you think about the Rangers uh, Devils the other night? That yeah, you've been in that situation, obviously. Actually, you were a centerman, centerman for, yeah, for a right. couple minutes there. But uh, what did you think about that? Well, just stop the back, right? You can't forget about the face off on those line yeah, rolls. That's that's right. That's right? right. Somebody's got to win the draw. Might you're, well you're wearing you wearing the face <laughs> off. Westgard's grabbing you, right? It was like you want hey, that puck pro- back. Priorities, right? That's Priorities. It, yeah. We can get to the fighting. Um, I don't know. Like I, I'm sitting back. Obviously, I I was in uh, I was in Vegas actually watching the U16 Nationals when that happened, and it was everywhere on the TVs in Vegas and all the casinos afterwards. I mean, um, there's there's some people that don't like it, but there's the majority of hockey fans that are super entertained by a line brawl. And fighting is up this year in general. And, um, and you know, it, it was tapered for a while, and this is a bigger discussion, but I just think fighting is like a representation of passion. So when there's fighting, it's because there's not as many tough guys anymore. There's not as many designated fighters. Like, you know, the Rempes, the Reeves, there, there's some of those guys still, the McDermott's, but... Their fighting is up this year because everyone is just playing with so much passion. I think that that's when the game is at its best. When, yeah, there's 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 a ton of skill now. There's a ton of speed. The game's never been faster and more skilled. But the last couple of years prior, like nobody wants to watch all these guys skate around and do skill moves and just not finish their checks and break a sweat. Like I want to see skill and speed amongst other guys trying to hit them and trying to slow them down. Yeah. And I think that passion has really gotten up in the last this year, especially. And, and that's why you see all the fighting. And this Rempe kid, like much like us, he comes into the league and he's just trying to stay in the league. Yeah. And yeah, his first game, he fought Matt Martin asked him, like, you're six foot seven. Guys are going to ask you to fight, whether you're tough or not. So he says yes to Matt Martin. And uh, what a feeling to fight in front of everybody at MetLife. Wow. And then, you know, like now guys want him a little bit. He runs around, he throws hits because he's trying to stay in the league. And he only plays like five, six minutes a night. He's trying to make the most of his minutes and bring energy. So, uh, you know, he throws the hit at Bastion. And, yeah, you know, now McDermott's asking him, like, I don't know. I, I think the whole thing was handled the right way by everybody, by McDermott, by him, by the line mates saying, hey, like, we're fighting. Like, you're, Jacob Truba and Keandre Miller are two of their – besides Fox, that's their two best D. And they're right in the war with them. Like, yeah, that's yeah. what they – that tells you what they think of Rampe. Right. We have your back. And then the guys on the Jersey side, Marino and the guys that have nothing to do with Rempe hitting, you know, they're in the fight. They're in the battle, too. They're like, yeah, McDermott, you're fighting. We're right with you. So I don't know. I, I love that stuff, obviously. Yeah, yeah no yeah. doubt. What, what were your thoughts on like the, the, the second game that the Rangers played the Devils after the Devils had acquired McDermott re- related to the, the hit on Bastion? Like. Like Rempe should have probably just dealt with it then, right? I mean, I know he's very active. I think he had fought in like every game. Yeah, so I understand maybe Lavi's telling him to pump the brakes, but like, you know, I'm just thinking. Like I was talking to Nasty before. I'm like, fuck. I'm like, I would have just just dealt dealt with that because cl- clearly, you know, they they went and traded for this guy to deal with me, and you know, and um, you know, just you, you, you drop the gloves, you dust it up, and then it kind of kills it but you know obviously didn't and then he runs over whoever that was and blows him up in three game suspension (laughs) you talk about like building a storyline oh obviously msg here we go it's like well that's the thing like like if if he fights mcdermott right away it it does squash it um by him not fighting mcdermott it kind of leaves open mcdermott and some of the devil's guys to maybe do something to fox and panarin and those guys so right that was that was a little bit risky but from his perspective and from the Rangers perspective, like you're going to go and trade for a heavyweight to fight our guy. Like we're going to make you wait. Like we're going to yeah. make you and on our, on our terms. Right. Like, yep, so I, or, or maybe it's, maybe his hand was busted up. Cause you're right. He fought the Laurier fought. Uh, um, who else did Olivier. he fight? Reeves at that point. Olivier. Olivier. Olivier right, yeah. So maybe his hands busted up and he needed another week or something like that. But I, I don't mind it. I be just from their perspective, like, Hey, I'll fight you, but like it's gonna be on my terms, right? Like, yeah. it's a great. You're not gonna idea. like, and, and McDermott was so like riled up; he was ready to go. And <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. So <laughs> it almost like served his purpose, right? And then yeah. he's the the kid's clearly not afraid. Like you see him, like, hey, yeah, yeah. let's let's do this when it was r- the right time. So yeah, I don't mind that. I don't mind that from the Rangers' perspective. Yeah, I agree, and I and I think you know, knowing Lavi, it was it was probably coached a little bit, you know, just probably to exactly what you're talking about. He's like, listen, like let's like like. 
let's do this our way, you know, like let, mm-hmm. let it come to you, however that plays out. And then obviously, you know, game three, the devils are, are starting McDermott and these other guys like, like Lavi could easily not, have, <laughs> yeah, you know, l- line Rempy up up there. But then, then to your point, you know, does McDermott just grab whoever just, just because like, here we go. You know, so, you know, so in our Lavi's line, bro, is the same thing. Like, and that's why I wasn't sure why Laviolette was so mad afterwards at Travis Green because the home yeah. team gets the opportunity to, to pick their lineup after. So for ours, like in Calgary, they were starting McGratton and Westgarth. And Torts comes into the dressing room before and he's so he's like, this idiot, Hartley, I don't like this guy. He's a loser. He's starting his idiots. He's like, well, I got to start ours. I don't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like, it's not like, uh, like Hartley's totally to blame, right? Like, right. Like, like he's like, I can't put the Sedins out there. I just, I just can't do it. So, uh, Sestito, you're going. And, uh, and I, for Dale Weiss, you're Dale going. Weiss, yeah. And I'm like, can I go, coach? Yeah, yeah, you're going. Garrison, you're going. So, uh it's funny because the home team can defuse it but you're right then it's it's a ticking time bomb and it's just inevitable right so you might as well just meet it straight on and and you see everybody smiling and laughing and high-fiving on the penalty box it's a galvanizing moment for sure for both teams yeah i agree yeah because if it went the other way and he and he he starts anybody else but those guys like and then something happens like you get demonized you get crucified for not throwing your tough guys out and then, and then all of a sudden it's like the other side is like all oh, a full-on brawl and then you're gonna get you know you get ripped on for why would you throw those guys you know of course like it's john scott when he john scott two-handed for kessel exactly that's exactly that's right. right yeah craig, craig baruby's good good friend of ours and uh he's he's told us a few stories where uh i think it was dale puritan was running around and <clears throat> he went over to leach brian leach is the captain of the rangers he says hey you better tell him to settle the fuck down or I'm going to grab you or Zubov and I'm going to beat the fucking brakes off of you right here. And he <laughs> says, Leach goes, hey, fuck off. Tells, tells uh, Puritan yeah. to like fucking knock it off, man. Yeah, but was that not a tactic you used, Riley? Like I use oh, that line all the time. Like the, Always. The, Swede, the Swedes would make me go to Cronwell before every game and warm up at the red line. And they, because they were, they loved him, but they're like, this guy can hurt people with his heads. Yep. And I would go to Cronwell every game and I would say, hey, you know, like all those hits, like not tonight, like don't do it tonight. Like, and he goes, what do you mean? What do you mean? I go, you know what I mean? I go, I've never been suspended. I've never been fined. I go, I have a lot of people behind me that will take care of me. I go, I'm, I will, I will, I will hurt you. Yeah. <laughs> he's, like, yeah. he's like, oh, okay, Kev, I don't do, I'm not, I'm not saying that you did, <laughs> but I'm saying if you throw one of those hits, like I will get you tonight. And he, and he never did luckily. Right. So the Swedes are like. Just, just say something to him, Juice. Just make sure he doesn't hit us like he hits him. Right, I'll, yeah. I'll try. I'll try. But keep your head up. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Yeah, that goes a long way, right? I mean, it's like the whole accountability piece, I don't think most people realize how how powerful that element is, right? Because, yeah, some guys will still cross the line knowing that the other team has somebody that they have to deal with. But, like, I, I could remember, like, you know, expecting to fight George the Rock, and all of a sudden George the Rock's not in the lineup. It was like, oh, well, now I can run around even more than I was going to run around anyways. You know what I mean? And that energy that I can, you know, bring is even beyond anything that I would have already brought because just because of that. So it's like, you know, getting someone's face in their ear a little bit. It's it does. It does deter some some poor behavior at, at times, at least. Yeah. And I've seen a few of those. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Games. Yeah. I saw a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you, you mentioned just kind of shifting gears here a little bit. I think it's important piece to talk about you know the, the mental health crisis that we're in you, you talked about your boy rick ripping it's it's hard to believe it's you know been what 13 years 2011 i believe yeah. um you know, can you talk about rick a little bit and you know, obviously your relationship with him and how important like the, the work you do and you know, I, th- I believe that you were like the the first teammate that he had confided in you know when he was going through his struggles uh just the importance of being vulnerable and and, and speaking your heart and asking for help yeah, I mean, it's just one of those things where, like, you can look at someone who's the toughest guy physically and 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 on the ice, and and then you don't know what's going on in his personal life and in his head. So we we were driving to training camp when he first confided in me and saying, like, I almost didn't come back this year. And I remember thinking, like, we were young guys. We played in the HL together. We got called up at the same time together. We we're now like, we're in the NHL, playing out our goals, like our dreams of our life that we've worked so hard for. I just couldn't. I couldn't fathom, like, how are you feeling like this? What do you mean? Like, what do you mean you didn't come back? We've been working for this for our whole lives. Like, we're in, like, 
we're like, let's enjoy it now. Right. We're at the top. That kind of made me worry a little bit. And then we just kept talking. I could just see he was struggling off the ice and struggling with some of these things. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't do anything special. Like I just listened and, um, absence and then uh, me and Craig Heisinger who you guys know we went and got him after one game and uh, we're playing Edmonton and it was in a snowstorm and after the game Zinger and I rented a car and we drove no we flew to Lethbridge and then we drove from Lethbridge to and we didn't know because Rick wasn't answering his phone anymore and uh, we basically like we made a plan like we got to get this guy to come back to Vancouver because that's the only way we can help him and and we're like what if he doesn't want to come and we like had this plan where like Zinger was going to distract him and I was going to like choke him out from behind and then we're going to drag him <laughs> into the car. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> and I'm like, let me, let's, let's think about this one, Zinger. So you think I'm going to be able to choke him out? And like, so when do I stop? Like, and then we, he's like, no, but like, let's just like, kind of like physically get him in the car. I'm like, I don't think this is a weird thing. <laughs> so anyways, luckily we were able to talk him into coming back and, and then he like he was in the program and he uh he tried to get help and he had a lot of support from the team from all of his teammates everybody like nobody knew what was going on with them when he was taking his leave of absence absences but they were all asking me like is he okay is he okay like everybody wanted to help like the city knows edler all these guys wanted to help him out and everyone was super supportive and it was one of those things where just he couldn't overcome it and mm-hmm. in the summer he took his life and you know, he loved being around the guys and he loved him and that was like his safe haven. But when he was on his own, he was, he couldn't handle some of these thoughts. So, um, you know, following in his legacy, just trying to, you know, do what I can to build awareness. So something like this doesn't happen again. And obviously it's going to happen, but, um, if, if you can help one out of a hundred people, then all this was worth it and all the awareness and starting hockey talks, and uh mindcheck.ca was the original website that we kind of relaunched getting kids that were struggling and adolescents that were struggling with some of these feelings and thoughts to go online fill out a self-awareness survey and then we can kind of like direct them towards the proper channels whether it's a doctor a therapist somebody to talk to the first stage is always when someone um you know starts to kind of open up to you it's your responsibility to be that ear for them and allow them to get that burden off. You don't have to give advice. You don't definitely don't have to pass judgment. But if you're that person with your friend or family that they open up to, you you have to be that ear for them, that outlet for them. So that's what I tried to be for Rick. That's what I'm trying to get, build the, you know, the message and the awareness uh, across the board that mental health, they're themed about it. It's not a weakness. It's a sickness. So if you're struggling inside, you don't have to internalize it and think, Oh, I'm soft. Oh, I'm mentally weak. Like that was always the stigma. And and that's why a lot of these kids don't end up asking. So we're trying to destigmatize it. Like everyone in the community that's been like Michael Landsberg's been a huge uh, advocate. Yeah. Uh, the mm-hmm. Canucks have been huge. The rest of the league has jumped on board. Destigmatize it. If you're having mental illness, get help. Right. If you have yeah. like a knee injury, you get help. If you have like a shoulder, you get help. So this is the same kind of thing. People, kids don't have to die ask for help and there's a lot of people out there that will help yeah, yeah exactly. no, it's great advice yeah because it's i think that's the hardest part is asking for help because there, there, there is that dark cloud in society where you know it is a toughness it is a show you know we think it's a sign of weakness and that's why i'm in the same camp as you are is like if, if you're feeling if you're feeling like this you have to ask for help because no one knows like you know like so many people do a great job at appearing like everything's okay until it's not right i mean i recently lost chris simon here right and i, I think he i think everyone had kind of been known he'd been struggling but like god like you know maybe get a again this is more complicated than just like you know one-off situations of like you know just just struggling in general it's mental health is more complicated than just like you know one specific event it's generally deep-seated and maybe some childhood trauma and then you're mixing in substance abuse and you know in these cases probably head trauma right i mean fighting is probably not the best mm-hmm. thing for for mental health but like I, i'm not sure that this is a fighting issue you know it's much deeper than that and uh you know guys are struggling not even just hockey and sports i mean this is like this is way beyond sport i think it's just we just highlight some of these situations and um well the thing you know, is like if that's... there was if there was nothing we could do about it and yeah like sharing or confiding in somebody would kind of be useless but there's things that can help now right like if it's if it's cte concussion based like there's some great doctors out there like dr 
Stefan Siglat is a guy in Vancouver. Anytime I had my, I would go see him. He would rearrange my dura in my head and I would sleep like, like a baby. And I'd feel that clarity the next day. I wouldn't have that fogginess. So did that help me in my career? Like probably a ton, right? There, there's just like that and, and, and natural paths and chiropractors, but there's also like there's medication in the right situation also helps to balance you. If you have severe anxiety, depression, sometimes just taking a pill will help. And I'm not advocating for medication for everyone, but for some people, like for my wife, for instance, you know, it's, it's changed her life. It's, it's balanced her out. So there's a lot, like maybe some people just need to talk to a therapist and have somebody talking through their thoughts. There's, there's methods that work. So that's the reason why I, I encourage people to ask for help because you could be helped. You could be helped saved, right? Some situations it's not going to work, but there's some kids that could definitely get the help. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's uh, super important because, I mean, I, I do do a lot of work in youth hockey and I see this like the beginning of the dark clouds presenting themselves. And it's, you know, a combination of a lot of things, but maybe pressure from the parents, you know, pressure from the coaches. And then obviously the pressure we put on ourselves, unrealistic pressures and, um, you know, in the competition, the ego in it all. Right. I mean, it's 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 almost like a it's probably unhealthier now than it's ever been. Right. Youth sports. It's just like it's wild. And it's just like the, the, so the more we can talk about this and at least present some solutions, the, the biggest one is just ask for help when you're you know, you're struggling. But um, it's it's a problem. It's it's, no, it's not going away. I have to say, I was going to say, uh, Juice, I was a uh, I'm known, still known. I, I'm working with a junior team now. I've been away from the Flyers now for what's been three years now. But uh, I work with a junior team and I'm. Even with the Flyers, I'm known as a little bit of a prankster. Uh, <laughs> but I'll, I got to say, dude, when you did, when you were the, uh, oh, the yeah. security guy, I, I've probably watched that. That's one so of my good. favorite things ever. I, I want to do something like that, but... It, <laughs> Dude, the, you get the mole, just everything, and he got the he's got the wand. So boys are like, fucking gets. He's like, what the fuck's going on here? How much fun was that for you, man? That that was a lot of fun. The year before that, they maybe be the stick boy or the yeah, shovel yeah. shovel boy. Ice and ice crew, the, right? It was the first uh, preseason game of the season, so like most of the young guys were playing. So I did that, and that was fun. And then the next year, like we got to do it again. But the only person that knew was Bob Murray, the GM. And me and the one lady that worked for the team, no, none of the players knew. They're like, okay, the guys come to the rink at four o'clock, you know, in Anaheim down the ramp yep. there and come in their nice cars and their suits. They're like, can you come for one o'clock for makeup? I'm like, what? I'm not coming at one o'clock and then staying till 10 at night because I'm not even playing. So anyways, I did end up going and like two hours of makeup to put the mole on and the nose and all that stuff. And, uh, no, it was, it was a lot of fun. They didn't show some of the other stuff, but, uh, I got I got most of the guys pretty good. Uh, yeah, it was classic. It was hilarious, cut. man. I, I I don't think anybody really knew because uh, they all went back into the dressing room after and they're like, "Who's that security guy? Like, what a loser <laughs> that guy!" Is. Like, <laughs> they were all talking about me. That's how I knew I got them. And some of them didn't know till after the game, which was no amazing. way. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. God. After the game, I came in and I said something to Cam Fowler, and he goes, "That was you." And he goes. <laughs> Because I was like pat, patting his quads. I'm like, wow, you got big legs. You yeah, got big, yeah. strong legs. You must be a good skater. <laughs> you imagine the boys. Just, oh, what man. The fuck's happening and I go right to Casse. Casse is a Czech, Czech guy. And yeah. I go, what are you, Czech or something? Or no, I go, what are you, Russian? He goes, Czech. I go, same thing. Like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> Czechs and Russians like, don't want to be called. The, so, right. uh, yeah. We had his brother here. David. That's right. Yeah. His brother David, played yeah. here a little bit. That's David. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that was uh, fun. Those, uh, those jokes good. are always fun, right? Those are always fun yeah. to do with the boys. It was awesome. I also want to throw out a uh, quick shout out to a couple of equipment guys since I was an equipment guy. You had a couple of legends, man. Uh, you had Sluggo, right? And, and Anaheim, and obviously Pat O'Neill, who's just a fucking legend as well. Yeah, a lot, a lot of games between those two guys, right? Yeah. And Sluggo, uh, I remember when Sluggo, we, we got him a boat for his retirement. And yeah. uh, big fisherman. Cool. But it's funny, I remember Randy Carlisle coming to like a few of us, like the leadership group, and they're like, uh, calls us into his office before practice. He goes, uh, what, are you, what are you guys getting Sluggo for his retirement? And I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, like he's retiring at the end of the season. And I'm like, well, I think like we have like uh, a watch or something he's going to get. He goes, no, you guys are going to get him a boat. I'm like, what? What do you mean boat? He goes, you're going to get him a boat and you're going to roll it onto the ice. I go, 
okay. So like, hey, team meeting <laughs> boys. boys, we got a little collection here. Uh, we got to get Sluggo a boat. And I remember guys like, we're getting him a boat? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, like he he deserved it obviously, but it was uh, it was funny like it's kind of pushed on to us. Hey, you're getting him a boat and you're gonna like wheel it out of the ice. So we did it and he lo- he loved it and yeah. What what a beauty! Like one of the best things is going into the back room with the trainers and just shooting the breeze, and that's something I always love. Like whenever you're kind of like, you know, you're at the rink and you're in a bad mood, you just got yelled at or you got bad video. Just go back and hang out with the trainers for a bit. They'll put yeah. you in a good mood. I, I miss that the most. Yeah. yeah. Patty O'Neill is the best in red. And those guys, like, yeah. I just love sitting in their back little room on their uh, high chairs there and just shooting the breeze with them and grabbing, like, wherever on the road, you're like in Chicago, you're like, where are the trainers? I'm going to go find them for a beer. Yeah. And just just want to hang out with the trainers. Great guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I miss that more than anything. Riles probably spent most of his time in my office. Yeah, I did. I think I spent more time in Nasty's <laughs> office than I did in the locker room or uh, I mean, the video room for sure. Hit, we had Hitch. Well, my first full season as the head guy, Hitch was our coach, but he he didn't fortunately didn't make it too long. It is about nine, ten games, but he used to walk by and be like, what are you guys doing in here? I had like 10 <laughs> yeah, of the guys, guys literally sitting on the floor in my office and a couple in the hallway. We were just laughing and shooting the shit. And here comes Hitch down the hallway. What the fuck's going on? Get out of here. Yeah. I was like, fuck off. Hitch. Holding court. <laughs> so, many, so many Hitch stories over the years, right? I can't yeah. even tell, tell some of them that I've heard from players that have played for them. Yeah. I think I know some of them. Probably There's a couple. To, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Man. Beauty, he was juice man. We can't thank you enough for your time, man. I know you're a busy man. Uh, we've been really, I, I've been really looking forward to this one since uh, Riles told me, but uh, thank you so much, man. I had a lot of fun, boys. Appreciate it. Uh, keep up the good work, yeah. Thanks, you too. Yeah, you do a hell of a job on TV yeah, there, so really good. A great representation of the game. Keep it up. Thanks, thanks, buddy. Thanks, boys. All right, big thank you to our friend Kevin Bieksa yeah. hopping on. Awesome, Beauty. awesome guy. Yeah. Loved him as a player, which I said ten times. But yeah, yeah, he would have been a perfect flyer. Oh my god, he would have tough as nails. Obviously, yep. Superman punching guys. You don't see that Clark very Kent. often. Yeah, coming at you. Hey, why not? Why not? We're hurt. Made it look easy. <laughs> sure did, man. You know what I was thinking about him? One of your obviously one of your best fights. Didn't last long was your one punch on um on Wa. But like I wonder if you come flying in like that, he comes in with a Superman if you both go down. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause what if he like think about that, like every time he did it in those fights, he's throwing the right, but a left was a guy. You guys could have hit him with a fist too. We could have. You could have. Because you're a big lefty. You, try it left. you never did the Superman. You should try I men's never. league. Do the Superman and men's league. Yeah, you know it's uh, it takes a lot of balls. To, it does because you up. can get caught with one. You can get caught. But I don't think you're expecting it. I don't think so. You gotta make sure you know you're you landing properly. He yeah, landed I mean it's well, I mean like <laughs> landing on your feet, but oh, uh, oh I know what you mean. Actually, yeah. the punch too. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of all in on those types of plays. That's kind of like coming in with the bomb, right? I mean, you, you better hope you land it because you, you can throw hope. yourself off. But you're right. It was well executed. Give him very well full executed. props. Hundred percent full props. It's Tough that time, Nast. Let's go. Is it that time? Whew. Time for the KK clear questions. Oh, Brought yeah. Brought to you by Clear Rum. Go to clearrum.com slash shop. Type in nasty2023 for your code and you get 35% off on your order in PA only. Oh, yeah. But you got to get it in here. You got to get in you. You know it. It's that time. Let's, Let's go. Do it, baller. Starting us off here, we got a message over on Instagram from Sal Rafa. All right. He asked, Sush, who was the most entertaining player or staff on the road or unpacking equipment? Well, I mean, <laughs> Sush, you put yourself out there. Now videos are coming because I've got a million uh. of the Sush man in action. He was always entertaining. B-Rad was right there with yeah. him. But Sal was probably, we would get overtired. And just do dumb shit and giggle and laugh at 3 a.m. When no one really wanted to be there. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus underneath the new show that 
dumb shit started happening. And Baller, I will flood you with videos for this one. Sal, sorry you asked for it. One of my favorite moments was him and in the bag. Well, that Big bag. that was good. We, he was really good at that because he's like I'm a small guy. He's a he's a little shorter than me. We we took Are you sure? I, yes because. I want I'm to telling see that. you, it's I want true. To see head to head. But I will tell you this: we always stood together at team pictures, and as soon as the guy would go one, two, and you're up, I go tip those, and yeah. I push him down. He yeah. would get so fucking mad. I looked like I was like this much taller. Uh, but yeah, Sal, we had a we had so much fun. We worked together with the Phantoms. Obviously, he was there the year we won the, uh, the Calder Cup the yep. second time. Um, but Sal was awesome. We had we had so much fun and boy he hated snapchat at 3 a.m because i just had oh, i was blowing him up blowing him up. <laughs> oh yeah uh sal you asked for it so yeah. the vids are coming there's a few coming sal is awesome a lot yeah. of fun always always being silly and goofing off yeah and keeping guys light uh what was the story with him and was it was it friggy with the coffee was he pop oh up? man i think we told that one time when fridge was on but yeah like so i got him in the bag yeah. and the boys are coming in off the you guys were coming in off the bus we were in maine and uh, I think it was a Sunday. It was three and three. It might have been three and three. And Fridge, you guys all are coming in with your coffee. So I'm like, hey, Fridgey, you know, like, he's a good guy, right? Yeah. He'll help me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this bag's heavy. It's laundry. Can you give me a hand with it? Oh, yeah. Goes down. Fuck, Sal comes out. Fridge jumps. Hot coffee <laughs> oh. right on fucking Sush. He <laughs> was. I'm never doing it again. Oh, man. I'm never doing it again. Yeah, Fridgey threw the hot coffee on him. Not oh, cool. Yeah. Prank on bad. <laughs> Right, the old bad. hot coffee in First the face. sushi went uh, bad. <laughs> no, I didn't get burnt. No. Sal did. Uh, but anyway. Sorry, Sal. Yeah. Appreciate you. Yeah. Hope you're well. We got Super Dino Mike over on Twitter. Ooh. He asked, do players get to go to Sixers, Eagles, Phillies game for free? Sometimes they do, yeah. For the most part, I remember we used to, even me, like, well, guys would get the tickets, but for – for me, I'm a basketball guy, and we used to. I got to go a few times. Even I think we went together one time with Richie. Did yep. Richie take us, and we split it up. But uh, yeah, we used to. You guys used to get tickets on the floor, Mr. Snyder's seats there, and I, I know guys still go to games. They get those floor seats. Mm -hmm. Eagles, yeah. If it worked out for the team, we got tickets. Yeah, for anything really. Yeah, lucky, very lucky with things like that. Concerts, our boy Jeff Gordon. Oh yeah, at Live Nation always still takes care of the boys and. Uh, it's been great to me, and, and I know you as well. Yeah. And our boy Malcolm. Oh, yeah, Malcolm. Yep. Yeah, the perks of yep. playing in big cities, I guess. And and, it's and nice. It yeah, is nice. I mean, very, very fortunate for that. I never, never take that for granted, yeah, that's know. for sure. Yeah, it was always a blessing. And uh, always different people trying to help and, and share their boxes and whatever else yep. with, the, with the boys. So the courtside Tickets weren't always uh, up for grabs for not just uh, any guy on the team. That's you know, right. You to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to be patient, get the tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get the tap for that. Yeah. So, great question. Yeah, it is a good question. Bunk1 over on Twitter asked, what was it like having Chris Pronger on the team? Prong daddy. Bunk, see. Uh, but, foo, big foo. He was great, man. One of my favorite things ever. Every morning when he walked in. Huggy. Oh, yeah. Huggy would be waiting on him, eh? Every day, and Prongs would walk in, and he'd be like, Morning, Chris. <laughs> and Prongs, fuck you, Snuggles. <laughs> yeah, right away in the morning. Just kidding. Just Obviously, love he loved Huggy. Yeah. Um, Prongs was awesome, man. You talk about a guy that, Riles, you could talk on it. He didn't care who you were. You, If you weren't doing something right, including himself, he yep. would say it. and You'd hear about it. You would hear about it, and I mean anyone. Mm -hmm. From veterans that were on the team to you know even Rick staff, staff probably staff too. probably yeah. Luckily, he never yelled at me. No. <laughs> he never got well. I Maybe loved, some of I his gear stuff, him. right? I tricked him. Yeah, right? I, yeah. We talked about that. He never knew it. Well, until it had, until I told until him. Until he told him, yeah. tricked him on his gear. But uh, yeah, he was awesome. That's a great question. That guy, talk about a just pro. Everything he did was, I mean, the way you would want your whole team to do. Yeah, right? like it's hard to get you know, 24 guys to, to come prepare the way prongs did, but he showed up every day, yeah. literally every day for every practice, every game. You don't have to worry about that. with him. Yeah. And he was obviously one of those last few, like real old school oh, guys. Man. He uh, could have had a penalty league. called on him every, oh, every shift. Every <laughs> night. I've never seen a guy where I think we said this too before where the refs were, I think they were afraid of him. 
Oh, I'm sure. I've yeah. never seen a guy speak to referees yeah. the way Prongs got away with. Like totally. it was crazy because it was Prongs, I mean, and he would just he would like two hand a guy break their arm and be like, "Yo, what he, he hit me?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it was unreal. Yeah, I always like Prongs. And, you know, he's one of the early guys at the ring. So Rigatoni, that's Rigatoni, where Rigatoni yeah, came Prong from. Prong Daddy, you are the originator he of is. Rigatoni. So story goes, I mean. Nast, I think you came up with Riggs, right? Rig, yeah, I would Riggs, say Riggs, but he... Riggs, and then Riggs sort of, sort of slowly became Riggity. Riggity, Riggity Riles. Riles yep. I think maybe Ray Emery threw up, you know, something in there too. Yeah. And then and then Prong Daddy comes around, and obviously Riggs turns into Rig, Rig, Rigatoni. Rigatoni. Every day. You Every hear day. him yell it down the hall. Down the hallway. Rigatoni. Yeah, so apparently he's Pro- still Rigatoni. Yeah. Prongs was awesome, though. That's a great question. That yeah. guy was... Uh, he was amazing. God, he... Talk about a... First pass out of the diesel, oh, yeah. like this guy, it was tape to tape. Oh, yeah, I don't crispy. Care. Oh, my God. Like, he was so you ready for that thing, blew up right Oh, I blew <laughs> break my stick if oh, I try yeah. to take that pass. But what, what, uh, there's a reason he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable Absolutely. player, unbelievable leader. Great guy. I loved him. Yeah. Prong Daddy, hope you're well. Yeah, man. We got one more. This one's from Swoop70 Ken Murray over on Twitter. And he wants to know do you roll towards back? What was the question? Do you roll a fatty when you... Oh, no. Do you roll torch <laughs> back? Do you bring him back next year? Woo. Loaded question. Wow. I uh, guess we'll see how these next four games yeah, go. Yeah, I guess I mean, we'll see him. I would like to think up until the last seven games, he was up for Jack Adams. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he would have got it. I'd probably talk, but, uh, yeah. but I think his name is definitely in the bucket. So, you know, and then... And then this happens, so I think it all depends on it. If they, if they can squeeze in, I think he, I think he's definitely back. Yeah. But, I mean, an epic crumble, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be up in the air. I mean, some been some speculation there, but... Yeah, we've heard heard a lot of different things, but that he wanted to go maybe to go upstairs um, after this year. I don't know if that's true. We've heard that. I'm just yeah. saying we've heard that. I'm not saying that's, that's a fact. We've heard it. That's a great question, though, because... Oh man, I don't, I don't know. I think like, the timing of the question is tough because it's, yeah. they're they're in the middle of a crumble. Yeah, and um, if, if they can manage to salvage this, I mean, I, I think this conversation is different than if if these next four games continue to crumble. Yeah, um, I think the dialogue is, is certainly different around around him and and the season, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Maybe revisit that one. Yeah, in a I mean that's, weeks, that's but, a really good question and a tough one. Like you said, at this point in time, because you know, two weeks ago you would have said, "Hell yeah, hell yeah." Um, so, I guess we'll see. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, though. that's a great question. That's a wrap. That's it. We got four great questions. There. That was those were great questions. But that's a wrap for one fifty three. All right, in the books next week. Next week, one five four. Whew. Can you believe it? No. I still can't. Still can't. <laughs> <laughs> How could you? Oh, uh, no, right? All right. Be sure to uh, subscribe, like, comment. Great questions. Keep them coming. So until next week, stay safe, knuckleheads. See ya.